This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. I'm joined with Christine Albert to discuss a lot of the nitty gritty about this new EAST trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine coming out of Europe. Christine, welcome. Thank you, Rod. There's so much to talk about, right, Christine? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and, yes. and, I, and I think the natural comparison is going to be a journal club with a firm. A firm came out in 2002. And let's give our Heart Rhythm TV viewers a little head start on their journal club and arm them with some of the data. So when you look at a firm, it was 4,000 patients. East was nearly 3,000. But it's amazing how many similarities. The mean age was around 70. 35 and 38% had were enrolled after their first episode of AF. So actually, even though East was an early AF study, many of them were after their first episode in a firm. But importantly, about 80% of patients in both studies were able to achieve sinus rhythm. I think the most important difference is really the choice of the antiarrhythmics, which was much more class three heavy in a firm and more class one and dronetarone heavy in East. What do you think about the choice of antiarrhythmics and how that's going to change clinical practice? Yeah, no, it is striking. Uh, you know, it's amazing how a firm turned us all in, away from rhythm control years ago. Uh, and uh, now we are going to be turned back to, turned back to it. Um, and yes, you're right, the distribution of antirhythmics and also as we have discussed, uh, the option of ablation. Um, and even though it isn't the majority of the patients treated with ablation, a significant fraction were. So it really is the idea that as soon as you see atrial fibrillation, trying to get somebody in sinus rhythm, um, and the other thing that is really striking and different between the two trials is that we used to believe that once you were in, or we thought you were in sinus rhythm, you could stop oral anticoagulation. And again, that's changed over the years so that we do not stop oral anticoagulation. And in this trial, they did not stop oral anticoagulation. So one of the things you saw in the firm was an, a slightly increased risk of stroke, actually. Um, and that was probably due to stopping the oral anticoagulants. And I think it's quite impressive that this trial actually shows, at least numerically, less strokes in those in the sinus rhythm arm, despite the fact that 90% were on anticoagulation. Yes, and for our viewers, the, the rate of anticoagulation, which was obviously warfarin back in 2002 in a firm, was about 70% at the trial conclusion. And even in their main conclusions, they said all the strokes happened when they were subtherapeutic in INR and they had premature discontinuation because they thought they were in rhythm. Whereas we're seeing in a contemporary practice, which is really reflective in East, that 90% of patients are on NOAC or, or, or Coumadin. So yes. I think that's really a welcome, a welcome difference. What's also remarkable is, is, is that there's the same crossover rate, 15% from those that were assigned rhythm, um, that, that got rhythm to, to usual, um, believe it or not. And it actually goes both ways. So it's similar crossover. I do think what's going to be really Interesting because we have so many ablation fanatics. I don't know who those people might be um, <laughs> that they're going to say, well, what if all of them were ablation? And right, and then we start moving towards a cabana world, and that's why this is really a hybrid between cabana and a firm. And they would say, well, 19% got ablation, but what if it was 80%? You know, what do you think about what happens if people start generalizing this to now ablation being the predominant way that rhythm control is being achieved? I think it will, that, that is not what the study did. Um, they, you know, they, they aren't able to examine, you know, to say that ablation was better than drugs in the study because it wasn't randomized. Um, so I think we do then have to lean back on Cabana, uh, which suggested that the two, you know, were at least equivalent, but that, you know, atrial fibrillation ablation was better slightly at certain things like quality of life and symptomatic patients and recurrences of atrial fibrillation. So if you're trying to maintain sinus rhythm, you could see why some people might lean towards ablation. But remember, this is a population, I think very, you know, the mean age was quite old and, and it may be difficult, uh, may not be the right thing. And when you looked at Cabana, the age interaction was uh, not significant, but you definitely saw better results in younger patients than you did in older patients. So I think we're still gonna have to use some clinical judgment here. Uh, in this circumstance, despite the results of a new trial showing us the benefit of control strategy. Yeah, and as, as you mentioned, Christine, you know, the mean CHAD score here was three, 
So you see an 85 year old with CHADS one or two, although that's hard with just eight alone. It's not that we should be reaching for genetron for, for every single patient here, particularly those that are asymptomatic. And it's also interesting that there were no difference in the symptoms in both arms. It was 70% were asymptomatic regardless of strategy. And so much of what we do with AFib is symptom relief. Yes. So that's why I think we need to put that in context for, for our viewers. But the old adage when, when I trained, when you trained, is that everyone deserves a shot at normal rhythm that comes in with nuance at AFib. Right. And I think when you look at it in that regard, this is a beautiful trial, really well executed, over 100 centers to look at early intervention, which we know that the longer you're in AFib, the harder it is to get rid of that pest problem. Right. You know? So I think that's what was part of the genius of this, is the early intervention. I agree. Well, Christine, thank you for joining us. We're going to be having an infinite number of journal clubs, and East will be talked about for over 20 years in the future, which is really mm -hmm. exciting to, to know that we're sitting on, um, on this day of a, of a real pivotal trial. And it'll be exciting to see how this permeates through and gets adopted in clinical practice. Thank you, Christine. Oh, thank you, Rod.